second time the book of Corinthians, and today we begin chapter 14. Let me read to you the first five verses, and we're kind of just going to introduce the chapter today and uh, take some time to make sure that we're clued in to what this chapter is about. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1 says, Follow charity, follow after charity, and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, and to exhortation, and to comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesy. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do pray that everything that we've studied, some chapter 12 up and through 13, uh, would prepare us for what we're about to read and study in chapter 14 on this subject. And we pray that we won't be ignorant of this subject, as chapter 12 calls us not to be ignorant of. And so we pray it'll be profitable and edifying for the saints today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Spiritual gifts has been the subject of 1 Corinthians since chapter 12. And in chapter 12 we establish the fact of what the spiritual gifts are, that they're special empowerments given by the Holy Spirit, that they're not natural empowerments or natural abilities, but supernatural empowerment given by the Spirit of God. And we saw also what they are for. And then, and then what we saw at the end of chapter 12 is in verse 31. Chapter 12, verse 31 says, Covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. So after he talks about spiritual gifts, he, starts talk, he begins in chapter 13 to explain what that more excellent way is. And, and chapter 13 is all about charity, uh, a high form of, of agape love, of God's love. But charity is that more excellent way, and as we went through chapter 13, charity is more excellent in that it is the greatest, I have greater in my notes, but when you think about it, it is the greatest motivator. The spiritual gifts didn't motivate uh, the, the, the Corinthians. They actually became carnal and were, were selfish in their use of it. Uh, but charity is the greater or the greatest motivator. It is a self-sacrificing for the benefit of others, and that's not how gifts were being used at Corinth, and it's really not the purpose of gifts, but uh, it, it should have been the purpose of gifts, but it wasn't being practiced that way. So charity is the more excellent way. It is more excellent in that it's profitable to others, but it's also, according to chapter 13, verse 3, it's profitable to God. It's something that God will reward. Charity is more excellent in that it never fails. But whether there'll be spiritual gifts, they are going to fail. They're going to cease. They're going to end. Uh, charity is a, a more excellent way in that uh, it, is the infant, it was the gift for the infancy of the body of Christ. When God turned from Israel to the Gentiles and is doing something different, that we saw that gifts are all related to revelation and communication uh, of God's word and even uh, confirmation of God's word. So someone knew that what a person is saying is the truth of God's word. They didn't have a Bible to study. So spiritual gifts were given in the infancy of the age of the body of Christ. But when you come to chapter 13, charity is the more excellent way in that it with its companions of faith and hope are when the body of Christ comes to maturity, to full understanding of the revelation of God for this age of grace, and will run faith, hope, and charity, run through the age of grace, the others end. So charity is the more excellent way. But again, chapter 12, verse 31 says, But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Chapter 13 is that more excellent way, but when you come to chapter 14, he told them to covet earnestly the best gifts. And you know, when, you, when I say that, I, 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 it keeps hitting my mind. What you learned in chapter 12 is the gifts are given severally, diversely by the Spirit as He wills. It's not up to you to will to have a gift. The Spirit was giving, when the Spirit was giving gifts, He gave it to different gifts to whom He decided to give them to. So it was kind of strange to end chapter 12 by saying, covet earnestly the best gifts. But that is not talking to an individual, you covet the best gift. 
It has to do with the body of Christ, the church at Corinth, that they ought to covet the best gifts and use the best gifts for the benefit of the body of Christ. And what you're going to learn in chapter 14 of what it is that best gifts are. It's gifts in chapter 12, but in chapter 14, the best gift is called prophecy. And, and what prophecy is is explained in the, in the verses. And what it is, it has to do with speaking. Well, look at chapter 14, verse 3. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, to exhortation, and doctrine. Sometimes we think prophecy is just forecasting the future. But that prophecy is speaking for God, or actually God speaking through the mouth of a man. And when God speaks through the mouth of these prophets, it wasn't just to tell them what the future is about. It had to do with edification, to instruct the body of Christ. It had to do with exhortation, the motivation of the body of Christ, what they should do now based on that doctrine, and the comfort of the body of Christ when they face certain issues. A prophet would speak and they would realize the comfort of Scripture. What greater comfort than the rapture, right? Comfort one another with these words. So, um, so prophecy, that, that's the purpose of prophecy. That's what prophecy is by definition. And when you come to chapter 14, the best gift that he's telling them to covet is prophecy. So chapter 14 is all about that. But the, if you read through chapter 14, if you haven't yet before today's study, I'm sure you will before next week's study. And when you do, you will find out that what I would call today's study is prophecy versus tongues. It's going to keep comparing, out of all the gifts, it's going to keep comparing prophecy and tongues. And it's doing that for the sake, as well next week will be the title of the message, will be, but rather prophesy. And you'll see why as, as we introduce the chapter a little bit. But the, it's going to talk about prophecy and tongues. For instance, look again at verse 2. It says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. Then verse 3, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification. So you got tongues, and then you go to prophecy. Verse 4, He that speaketh to, uh, in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So again, a comparison of tongues to prophecy. Verse 5, I would rather that I would, I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesy for, and he explains why he said that. So the whole chapter, that's not just the, the end of it there, that just kind of tease you a little bit to realize he's going to be comparing prophecy and tongues. There is no doubt from the very beginning of our study that the Corinthians were self-absorbed with the gift of tongues. They all wanted to speak with tongues. And, and Paul, not, not everybody speaks with tongues, but not everybody prophesies either. But in the assembly, the, more pro, the, the prominent gift that ought to be used is prophecy, not tongues. And you're going to see that this chapter diminishes the use of tongues and promotes the, the use of prophecy. And, and that's what the chapter is all about. So it's comparing those two because the Corinthians was absor were absorbed with tongues. And Paul's saying, I'd rather you prophesy. And he keeps explaining why prophecy is better than tongues. So he does that when I say they, it's all about prophecy and tongues. Pro the word prophecy or prophesying is found seven times in this one chapter. Now seven to me, that means something. It ought to mean something to you. That's a number of spiritual perfection. Tongues and tongue is found 15 times. And it's not because it's the more prominent. It's because it's the most misused. And so Paul has to deal with that more often. And so 15 times in that one chapter, he's going to speak about tongues. Now that's a lot, isn't it? So you're going to learn a lot about tongues in the chapter. So the theme of the chapter is but prophesy, but rather prophesy. Again, look at verse 1. Follow after charity. He just got done saying the more excellent way is charity. So follow after charity. Desire spiritual gifts, because they were operating. They haven't failed yet. They haven't been put away. They're still operating. They still don't have a complete Bible to, to go study the Bible. So follow after charity. Desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. And he's going to give list after list of why you should rather prophesy than speak in tongues. Verse 5. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesy. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh within, with an unknown tongue. Uh, doesn't say unknown tongue, does it? Speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. So the way tongues is beneficial is if there's an interpreter or if he can interpret what he's saying. So... So you can see that the theme that's going to run through this chapter is, but rather prophesy. Um, 
And when, you, when we said that covet earnestly the best gifts, look over in verse 39 of chapter 14. It's going to be the end. But, but at the end, he says this in verse 39. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. So tongues still had a place at that time in the Corinthian church. But if you're going to covet earnestly the best gift, gifts and the best gift, he tells you to covet prophecy. That's what you want going on in the assembly. You want someone to get up and let God speak through their mouth to edification, to exhortation, and to comfort. So you really, we just studied the whole chapter. You can just fill in the details, as we will in the weeks to come. But uh, that's what the chapter is all about. So that the benefit of prophecy is edification. Now let me point that out to you. Look again at verse 3. He says, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, to exhortation and comfort. Verse 5, I would rather that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesy, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. The emphasis is edifying the body of Christ, edifying the local church. Verse 12, Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifi 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 edifying of the church. So edification of the church, and that's done through prophecy, since they didn't have the word of God written at the time, that's the emphasis of the chapter. Verse 26, it says, uh, how, be it, how be it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you say, hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, let all things be done unto edifying. That's the emphasis of the chapter. And it's prophecy that's going to edify the saints. So, you get a gist of what the, the prophecy is about. And what I'm going to do for most of the study today is I purposely stayed away and, and just threw out a couple times the definition of what tongues are. I want to take the time to refute the modern day tongue talking movement uh, that everybody just, they speak in gibberish and think that's the gift of tongues. And I want, to, I want to tell you what their point of view is, their doctrine, how, why they're doing what they're doing from their own words. Uh, and then I want to refute it by using the scripture to do so. Because we have what, what Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 was talking about. Tongue, uh, pro, uh, charity was the more excellent way in that uh, um, faith, hope, and charity continue through the age of grace when grace comes to maturity that the spiritual gifts were given in the immature state of the body of Christ and were going to be done away, they're going to cease, going to be put away, going to put away childish things. They were going to end. But faith, hope, and charity continues. We don't live in the infancy of the body of Christ. The body of Christ has been running for 2,000 years and it's been running on what God left us after the infancy stage and that is Paul's scripture. The scriptures is what we have now to go by. And so because of that, go back to chapter 12. I, it was right there from the very beginning. And I kept emphasizing that because people overlook the introduction to spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 1 says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Well, what's going to cause you not to be ignorant about spiritual gifts? How about chapters 12, 13, and 14? there's where you're not going to be ignorant if you learn what these chapters are about. And we have them in writing. So they, they got it in writing from Paul, but then when Paul's scripture is complete, we have all the word of God to the body of Christ in Paul's epistles. But he goes on to say in verse 2, Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols even as you were led. Gentiles used to worship idols that couldn't talk. Well, why would you worship a stone or a piece of uh, rock or gold or an image that can't talk? Someone led you astray. Someone spoke to you and said, hey, this is a God. And he does this for you. And you should bow down and kiss his feet and all the rest. And, and the Gentiles did it. They did it out of ignorance because of listening to someone else talk about what the idol couldn't say for himself. See, we have God's word, <laughs> and God can't speak for himself. That's why he says in verse 3 how to test someone who's speaking. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. <laughs> well, that's pretty clear. <laughs> he must be speaking by the devil. And that no man uh, can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. 
the Holy Ghost is going to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can detect if this man's speaking the truth of God or not. So that's why we're talking about there's revelation gifts, communication gifts, confirmation gifts. And, and so, but the whole point is, is we're, we have today the complete word of, word of God. So that, as we kept saying in Ephesians chapter 4, that's like a parallel here. Ephesians 4, it says, when Jesus Christ ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. For the, edify, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we come to the unity of faith. And then it says that henceforth, once we have the complete word of God, that henceforth ye be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There's a lot of false doctrine out there, and people are cunning in explaining false doctrine so they could lead people away. That's the warning of chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Don't be a dumb Gentile led away. And, and there's people there with cunning craftiness that would lay, to lead you astray. Uh, but we have the complete word of God. We have the unity of faith. So we can then take what they say and look at the scripture to see if these things are so. Do you remember when they tried to trap the Lord Jesus Christ by asking tricky questions to him? There's a whole chapter 22 of, of Matthew where they're doing that. And the, the Sadducees asked a question about whose wife, this, she'd been married to seven men in the resurrection, whose wife she's going to be. Before the Lord answered the question, you know what he said to them? Ye do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. They wouldn't ask the question if they knew the scriptures. But they err. Here, these were the religious teachers of Israel. But they erred not knowing the scriptures. And why is it that so many people are carried around in modern day tongue-talking gibberish in many, many churches, and even like the Jehovah Witnesses do it, uh, the, the, who is it? The, the Masons do it in their own private. These, all these people do this kind of thing. Why, why is it that people do this and speak in gibberish? And it's because they're carried away by everyone to doctor, because they don't know the scriptures. And one of the things they don't know is they don't know what it's all about. But first, my first exposure to this, I've shared with you before, is... When I was 19, I moved down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And I told my dad, I'm not going down there to live in the world. I did move down there with three unsaved guys. We got an apartment, four months. We went four directions with our lives. We split up, went four different, I went to Bible college. But I told my dad, I, you know, I was saved, knew I was saved, and I knew I wanted to honor the Lord. But I went down there, and I'm on the beach, and they're passing out tracks. I said, hey, pretty good, give me one of those tracks. Then it talked about a meeting they have right near the beach in this room. So I showed up. And they're singing, playing guitar, singing. I thought, oh, that's pretty nice. I've never been around a group of Christians that sung this way. Then the guy stops and he says, let's have hands on this. I'm thinking, hands? What does that mean? Everybody shot their hands up and started groaning and moaning. And I mean, the guy behind me, you would think he's speaking Hebrew because it's all like <coughs> noise coming out of his mouth. And other people are speaking other just gibberish things. And but one thing I noticed is they have about three different sounds and then they repeat them again. I mean, you can only make up so many sounds when you don't know what you're saying. But anyhow, I'm standing there, I'm looking, their hands are up in the air, they're all gibbers. I'm scared out of my mind. I rode a motorcycle to that meeting and so when, the, when it was over, I just grabbed my helmet and headed to that bike as fast as I could. But they stopped me. They said, do you have the gift of the Holy Ghost? And I says, I'm not sure what you guys are talking about. He's, I says, but tell me this, how could a person get saved? Because that's about all I knew from the Bible. And he says, oh, you've got to repent of your sins, clean up your life, and turn it over to God. And I says, look, I says, salvation is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. By grace, through faith, are you saved? If you can't tell me how to get saved, I don't think you can tell me how to get something else. And I drove away, but that's all I knew. Wrote my dad a letter, hey, dad, what's tongues? <laughs> you know what his response was? Stay away from that. <laughs> he should have said, read 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. <laughs> so what, the reason I'm saying that to you is I want to tell you the false teaching of modern day tongue talking in gibberish. And what they say to you that explains what they're doing. And everything that I'm about to say to you is what either that group or other groups since then have shared with me when I would say, why do you speak gibberish? Because they're not talking another language, they're speaking gibberish. And, and here's what they say. They say, oh, we speak in an unknown tongue. 
Look at 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. Very clear, that's what they're doing. Uh, and then when you say, well, how come it sounds like gibberish? Oh, these are tongues of angels because we're speaking to God. Look over in chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and I have, I have not charity, it profit me nothing, but there says we're, we're speaking to God in angelic languages. So, oh, wow, you have a verse to prove that. Uh, and, then, and then you say, well, I don't understand anything that's being said. Well, we're praying, we're speaking of the mysteries of God but in, but in the Spirit. And that, again, is in verse 2. Verse 2 says, uh, how, uh, how be it, in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. So that's why I don't understand. They're speaking angelic language, they're speaking mysteries unto God, and therefore we don't understand what's being said. Uh, and then, why do you do that? Well, they said it's for self-edification. Look at verse 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. And they begin to explain to you how when I do this, I don't know why, but I feel so good. I feel like I, I've been in the presence of God. It makes me feel so good. I go home, I'm riding on a cloud. Wow, that's something. And then, then you say, well, what, is, what are you doing when you're doing that? Well, it, I'm praying in the Spirit. Look at, chapter, look at verse 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. Verse 15. Um, is it, I don't want to read the one part about it. Oh yeah, for, it says, What then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with understanding also. I will pray, I sing uh, with the spirit, and so forth. They're praying in the spirit, they're singing in the spirit. That, that's what they're doing. And they say, by the way, that's what Paul did. Look at verse 18. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than you all. So if you're going to be Pauline, especially, you're going to speak in tongues, and these are what you're doing when you're speaking in tongues. And you say, well, why do you do it? Well, chapter, chapter 14, verse 22. It says, wherefore, tongues are for a sign. And this is a sign that, that we have the Holy Ghost and we're filled with the Holy Ghost because we're speaking in tongues. Well, so there's the slight of words and cunning craftiness where why they lie in wait to deceive because they had verses didn't they and that's exactly how they explain what they're doing and why it sounds gibberish and not a language so if you noticed what I read in fact I under my breath said when I said verse 15 there's a part I didn't want to read if you notice what I read I read a half a verse every time I didn't read the verse the whole verse I didn't read the context I just grabbed what I wanted out of each one of those verses so I could explain why people practice gibberish and that's why they do it because of the half a verse that we just went over. So scripture, let's study the scripture and find out what is tongues and what is the purpose of tongues and, and not, not so much the purpose of tongues, we kind of covered that in, in uh, the purpose of gifts in chapter 12, but the uh, refuting what modern day tongue talkers are doing. First of all, when it says in verse 2, for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, the word unknown doesn't mean unknowable. There's a difference between the two. See, Corinth, if you look on a map, it's over in Greece. And if you went over there and spoke Hebrew, you would be speaking an unknown tongue. If you went there and spoke Latin, you'd be speaking an unknown tongue. If you went there and spoke in the language of the Iconiums, Lyconiums, I think it is. <laughs> Anyhow, you'd be speaking in an unknown tongue. Unknown, not that it's non unknowable, but it's unknown to the people that you're speaking to. It's not their language. And therefore, that's why Paul's talking. You're, you're at Corinth. You've all been raised at Corinth. Why are you getting up and speaking in an unknown tongue? What benefit is that? That's what he's addressing is something that's wrong. And, and it's not, he's not saying that these are unknowable languages, angelic languages, and all of that. First of all, tongues in your Bible, you can search the Bible, what are tongues? Let's, make, let's get this real clear before we go anywhere else. Go back to Genesis chapter 10. The first time the word tongue is used in your Bible, and the first time tongues, plural, is used in your Bible is in Genesis 10. Noah gets off the ark. He's supposed to multiply, replenish the earth, he and his sons, along with their wives. 
And it says in chapter 10 and verse 5, it says, By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided into their lands, every one after his tongue, after their family, and in their nations. Now notice he's dividing, they're becoming, these families are being divided into nations in different parts of the earth. What's causing them to be divided? And when they get divided, what are these tongues that they're being divided with? Keep that in mind. Because when you get to verse 20, it says, and it, what it is going through the three sons of Noah and how they're going in different directions. It says in verse 20, these are the sons of Ham after their family, after their tongues, plural, in their countries and in their nations. So you're dividing these sons of, of uh, Noah. If you get down to verse 31, the conclusion of chapter 10 is, These are the sons of Shem, after their family, after their tongue, in their land, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, after their generation, in their nations. And by these were the nations divided on the earth in, after the flood. So after Noah and his family got off the ark, they multiplied into nations, but then they were divided up in the earth. Why were they divided up in the earth, and what is this tongues that happened to them? Well, that's what Genesis chapter 11 is there to explain to you. Chapter 11, verse 1 says, And the whole earth was of one language and one speech. And as you read here, what happened is all the men... There, well, I'll just read it instead of tell you. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the, land, uh, from the east... They, came, they found a, a plain in the land of Shinar and dwelt there. And they said one to another, Let us make us brick and burn them thoroughly, and let us make brick for stone and slime for they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top might reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So as they're multiplying, they want to stay together, and they're really building a, re a political system and a religious system so that they can stay together and make man himself a name. Not to go out to the glory of God, not to fulfill what God called Noah and his sons to do, but to make themselves a name. And in that rebellion, God came down, and he says in verse 6, And the Lord said, Behold, the people are one, and they have all one, la uh, one language. And this they began to do, and now nothing shall be restra restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go, go to, let us go down, and there's the Godhead, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad upon, uh, from, the f from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Now by the way, the tribulation, they're going to get back together. One, one world government, one world religion. But the Lord, he, they can't get back together again, and still it's future before they're going to get back together because the Lord just did one simple thing. He confounded their language. And they were divided according to their nations and their families and their tongues in different places of the earth. Tongues are the languages of the nations that God divided them with when at the Tower of Babel. That's what tongues are in your Bible. To keep it just as simple as it is in your Bible, come to Acts chapter 1. God's purpose, and most people don't read their Bible, they don't even understand God's purpose for the nation of Israel, is that through Israel all the nations of the earth will be blessed. After Genesis 11, Genesis 12, God separated out Abraham and said, I'm going to make out of you a great nation. Why? So that the nations who turned to God, when they built that that tower will reach unto heaven, they're worshiping the stars of heaven. They're worshiping created beings, the, the angelic hosts that God created, rather than God. And, and so God raises up Abraham, and, and to Israel, they're not to bow down to any other god. No graven images at all. And Gentiles are bounding down to the graven images. But that it's going to be through the nation of Israel, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Well, Israel never became the people God wanted them to be, but they came close here in Acts chapter 1 when the 12 apostles are receive the Holy Spirit. It says their commission after the Lord is ready to send into heaven. It says in Acts 1 verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. That's the land of Israel. And unto the uttermost parts of the earth. 
So they're going to be a blessing to all the rest of the earth after they convert the nation of Israel. But you know they're going to have a problem doing that. All the nations of the earth, what languages do they speak? Well, notice verse 8 says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. The Holy Ghost is going to empower them to be able to go to the uttermost parts of the earth and speak. Well, look at chapter 2 where the Holy Ghost came. And verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Utter than their native tongue. It says, And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. The Jews have been scattered among the Gentiles, but they're back for the day of Pentecost. So when they're back on the day of Pentecost, they've been raised in all these other nations. And it says, And when this was, no, uh, was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled and said one to another, Behold, are not all these that speak Galileans? Now Galileans were fishermen. They didn't study the languages of the world. And here these Jews from all over the world are back in Jerusalem and they're hearing these Galileans, the twelve apostles, speak in the language wherein they were born. And how is this possible? Well, verse 8. And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? And it starts naming. They were able to hear it because the Spirit gave them the power to speak in tongues. And what are tongues? It's the languages of the nations. Now that's what tongues is. Tongues in your Bible is never gibberish. Where people got that is someone carried them away into a false doctrine. Never in the Bible did anyone stand up and speak gibberish. Well, you say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Paul said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and these are speaking mysteries to God in angelic languages, that's what, that's what tongues are, that's the argument. Well, come over with me to again 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I've already prepared you for this because we studied chapter 13. Remember, he's going to teach what's the more excellent way. So when he says in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians verse 1, he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. It don't matter what I can say, even if I could talk the tongues of an angel, it's a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal, if it's not done with charity. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and, and all knowledge, uh, isn't this the same chapter where Paul says, I know in part and prophesy in part? Does he understand all mysteries and all knowledge at this point? He doesn't. These are, when he says though, it's a hypothetical. He's going to the extreme, beyond reality. And, and you know that from verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, if I have not charity, it profit me nothing. Did Paul give all his money to the poor? You know what Paul used his money for? To support those that are with him to go out and preach the gospel to the Gentiles all over the world. That's what Paul used his money for. And he didn't give his body to be burned. He's writing Corinthians. He wasn't fried at the time. He's saying, if I did this extreme and didn't do, have it love, it's, it doesn't profit me anything. Paul never spoke the tongue of an angel every time in his life. This is all hypothetical speaking. It's not what tongues are. Tongues are the languages of the nations for the purpose of communicating God's word in those languages. And, and so there is no such things as men speaking with the tongues of angels. But didn't verse 2 of chapter 14 said they speak mysteries? Well, look at verse 2 again of chapter 14. But he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not, un, uh, not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. If you're speaking in an unknown tongue, God's, he knows every language, right? So God can understand you, but you need to teach God anything? <laughs> no, no man understands you. That's why he's telling you don't do it. And, and, and so as far as the men that you're speaking to in an unknown tongue, they're just looking at you and saying, man, this guy's speaking mysteries. I have no idea what he's saying. So is that why you should do it? <laughs> or is that why you shouldn't do it? <laughs> and that's what Paul's explaining, why you should not be speaking in tongues at Corinth when no man can understand what you're saying because it's an unknown tongue to everybody standing there. So it's not for the purpose of speaking mysteries unto God. 
God's the one who reveals mysteries and he revealed it to the Apostle Paul and Paul wrote it down in Scripture for us. Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 5 there. So when they say we're speaking spiritual mysteries to God, that's not the purpose of tongues and that's not what that verse is teaching. Well, they say it, it's self-edification. It makes me feel so good. I feel so spiritual I go home on a cloud. Well, look at verse 4 again. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Were spiritual gifts ever given for self-edification? Never. We learned right from the beginning of chapter 12 and verse 4, it says, now there are diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit. And then it says, uh, verse 8, but to one is given by the Spirit, to another, and names the gifts, and it says in verse 11, And all these work that self-same spirit, dividing every man severally as he wills. <laughs> I'm missing the verse. You can see that. But the purpose of, of spiritual gifts is to edify the whole body of Christ. God didn't give you a, a gift of speaking an angelic language so that you can get self-edification. If you spoke in an un, uh, angelic language, speaking mysteries, not even knowing what you're saying, how are you getting edified? What they're talking about is they have this wonderful feeling that they've been near to God. But you know, you go to a Catholic church and watch that priest, you know, do that incense and do that all holy stuff and supposedly holy stuff and, and wear that gown and give out that wafer and take that. People go there and when they go home they feel like, man, I've been that close to God today. It's a feeling, not based on truth. It's a religious experience. And uh, so when they say that it's self-edification, that's not the purpose of, of tongues. That, that's why you should not do it, because it would be selfish. That's not the purpose that God gave the tongues. It's for the edifying of the body of Christ. So they say, well, it, I'm praying in the Spirit. Well, it's, you're not praying in the Spirit when you speak in gibberish. Again, I, now I'll finish verse 15. It, well, verse 14 says, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit, pray, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Is there any place in the Bible where God would help you to be unfruitful? <laughs> is the spiritual gifts given you to be unfruitful? <laughs> that's, why, that's why this is a negative statement. That's why it's not good. Verse 15. What then? Because it's unfruitful. What then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with understanding also. I will sing in the Spirit, and I will sing with understanding also. Now that's fruitful, isn't it? So he's actually explaining why not to do it, and when someone speaks in tongues, or saying they're praying in the Spirit, if they speak in gibberish, they're praying in the flesh. They're not praying in the Spirit. That's all flesh. It's, they've learned it from someone else, they were taught it by someone else, carried away by wings of doctrine, and they think it's right, and it feels right, but scripturally, it's all wrong. It's nothing that's talked about in the Bible. So, the, that tells you they're not praying in the Spirit, they're in the flesh. Yes, Paul spake in tongues more than everybody else. You know, you got a book in your Bible that Paul was saved in Acts chapter 9. And from that point, you can follow three apostolic journeys of the Apostle Paul until he ends up in Rome and actually has input into Caesar's household from Rome. If he traveled all over the world, then don't you think he spoke with tongues everywhere he went? Now, let me just point out a couple verses. It, come to Acts chapter 17. This is just a little statement Paul makes. He, he's at Ephesus. A little statement that he makes, but it, it explains Paul's ministry. I'm not going to read the whole context. Acts chapter 17. He talks about the times of the Gentiles. In verse 30, he says this. He says, But the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That's Paul's ministry. God has now turned to all men, where at? Everywhere. And God sent the Apostle Paul out to speak to every man, everywhere, about what God's doing today, that God's now turned to the Gentiles, and even the Jews have another opportunity in this age of grace to get saved. Look over in chapter 22 when Paul gets arrested at Jerusalem, and he has an opportunity to address the Jews. It's 21, verse 40. 
He addresses the Jews in chapter 22, but here's, here's how he begins. In chapter 21, verse 40, it says, And when he had... And when he had given him license, that is, the captain of the Roman guards, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hands unto the people, that's the Jews that were gathered there, and when, they were, and, and when there was a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, and now you got chapter 22, here's what he said. So, Paul addressed the Jews. When he talked to the Jews, he finally got them to listen. He started speaking Hebrew. But notice what Hebrew is called, the Hebrew tongue. Paul said, I speak in tongues more than y'all. He could speak Italian. He could speak all those other places that I just mentioned, Greek and, and so forth. He, as he went everywhere, he had the ability to communicate in those languages. That's why he's saying, I speak in tongues more than you all, because he was the apostle of the Gentiles. God was speaking to the Gentiles, and Paul had those gift of tongues to speak. Because the purpose of speaking in tongues is to edify, to, to get the gospel out and then to edify the saints. So that's why Paul said he spoke in tongues more than y'all. He didn't just gibberish more than everybody else. That's his point in saying that. Uh, now we're running out of time. So um, it, one thing that, that I haven't expressed, come over to Romans chapter 8. I need to hit this one before we're done. One of the arguments that I didn't bring up that they say is that when you're praying in the spirit, the gibberish tongues that, that people do, they're saying that's the spirit making intercession for us. And they turn to Romans chapter 8 and verse 26 where it says, Likewise the spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. So they say, see, that when you, what you're hearing is these groanings of the Spirit making intercession for us to God the Father. Clever words, aren't they? The groanings, what does the Bible say about those groanings? They cannot be uttered. Why am I listening to you utter groanings? The verse you're trying to use to prove that gibberish is, is something special and spiritual, you're disobeying the verse because the verse says these groanings cannot be uttered and the next verse explains why they can't be uttered. And he that, know, he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is in the mind of the spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the word of God, will of God. The Holy Spirit within us when we don't know how to pray in certain situations as we ought, the Holy Spirit within us makes intercession for us to God the Father through mental telepathy, so to speak. The mind of the Spirit and the mind of God, and the Spirit is praying for us according to the will of God, but the Spirit's doing it to God the Father without using your mouth to do it, because it can't be uttered. See, everything they say about this, nothing matches scriptures, and yet it's huge. It's been huge for a long time. I, th I don't know if it's any diminished in these last days or not, but uh, for, 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 for decades, people have been bragging about speaking in tongues and they're calling it gibberish. I don't allow anybody to call it tongues. I call it gibberish. Tongues is the languages of the nations. And that's why as we continue to go through chapter 14, Paul's going to talk about how you need to use words easy to be understood because Prophecy is for the sake of edifying the saints. And if you speak in an unknown tongue, no one gets edified unless there's an interpreter. Now we can all be edified. So, as we said, the next week we'll address, start looking at chapter 14, look at the outline of chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, and realize why Paul is teaching, but rather prophesy. Speak, there's tongues going on, yes, but rather prophesy. And we'll see all his reasonings as we go through chapter 14 together. But I wanted to give you that warning before we start. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for your, your love and your grace. We thank you that it's communicated to us in a Bible. That we don't have to be tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. When people say something, we can go to the scriptures to see if it's so. Sometimes all we have to do is finish reading the verse or read the chapter in the context. And sometimes it's hard because we get taught incorrectly and we, we latch on to something because it was a lot of cunning craftiness in teaching us false doctrine. 
But I pray that we'll all have the spirit where we desire to know the truth of your word and that we would study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I pray that this has been edifying for the saints today. In Christ's name we pray.